So welcome everybody. Uh, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ken Kurtz. Uh, I'm with uh, a company called Steel, and I'll be uh, helping uh, us stay on topic today a little bit. And uh, I'd like to let each of my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Okay, sure. I'm James Williams. I'm the general counsel of Liquidity Services, which is a NASDAQ company. We are like an eBay for business, so we sell online in bulk on behalf of companies, the governments, and the federal government as well. Uh, good afternoon, or I guess good morning. My name is Christine Stickler, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer for TE Connectivity. We are in uh, electronic manufacturing, and we have about 80,000 employees and uh, operations in over 50 countries. And um, if you could indulge me a minute, I just wanted to give a special shout out to my team who is here, um, Brian Risser, uh, Shirley Yao, Lothar Liske, and, and Barbara Krizeki. Um, you know, they do a fantastic job supporting our compliance programs and, you know, wouldn't be here without their help and support. Uh, my name is Steve Donovan. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer for International Paper. It is a global manufacturer of paper and packaging products. Um, so let's get into it. Good. So uh, make sure everybody's in the right session. We're going to talk about uh, third, third party management. It's always, uh, by the way, has anybody ever been on a plane where somebody actually does get off the plane where they say, hey, is everybody going to? <laughs> I, I haven't, I always hear that, but I've never seen anybody get up and walk off the plane. <laughs> So we're going to talk about third-party management, uh, third-party compliance today, but we're going to talk about it uh, not really in a mechanical uh, way. Uh, we're going to talk about it more in context of change management. I think the uh, typical, the general audience that's here is, is, uh, uh, is relatively senior, uh, and so we want to keep the, the topic at uh, a programmatic level, and then our goal today is for each of us to say something really <coughs> meaningful and to give you kind of that nugget to take away. We have a, a short period of time here to sound uh, uh, really smart. So uh, just to introduce, uh, so the topic of, of third-party uh, compliance, and it, for the most part, when we think about third-party compliance, it's relative to... Uh, to anti-bribery, anti-corruption today. It seems to be the, 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 the broadest topic. And I think that one of the things that's important to recognize as we begin to talk about this is this is really a, a global movement. There's a, a proliferation of, of global regulations that's, uh, that's uh, you know, really materialized. And uh, I think that what we're dealing with today is uh, really we're in a time where business is fundamentally changing how we do business around the globe. And so it's not just this is a U.S. regulation, the rest of the world has to comply with that regulation. It is fundamentally how we're doing business. And we'll talk about that change management. We'll talk about how our businesses, uh, not just from a compliance standpoint, but how the actual business itself uh, is taking to this. Uh, I think another thing that we're going to, hear about today is uh, really the evolution of the compliance role. Uh, whether you're in a GC role or the compliance officer, uh, last night I had uh, dinner with a, a couple of folks and one of the people said, uh, yeah, you know, this is such a burden for me. This is not something that I want to deal with uh, is third party management. And so we find that most compliance groups have very limited resources, or for that matter, legal departments with compliance responsibility typically have like one to four people. And then certainly there are the exceptions where there's, there's larger teams, but how do you manage volume? How do you streamline your program, et cetera? So we're gonna be talking about uh, how uh, different companies approach the topic. Uh, the format today is we have uh, ahead of time, we've, we've discussed six questions, really six topics. And we're going to go through, we'll, each person will answer uh, a question from their perspective, and then I'll have a direct question for each of them. And at the end, uh, we'll, we'll have, I think, enough time for two or three questions uh, from the audience as well. And by the way, if you have a question you want to interrupt us we invite you to do so if there is a topic we could all kind of rip on that uh, we're fine with that as well so um, 
So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, initially, uh, this is really to, to each of the participants. When we talk about uh, kind of that life cycle, that life cycle starts with uh, uh, program development and onboarding, managing, monitoring, and auditing your, your third parties and who those third parties are changes by organization. And, uh, and I would ask that as you talk about, you know, maybe as you respond to each of these questions, you uh, m maybe you preface it with what segment of the third party population, you know, that's, that's really ad addressing. So the first question I have for the participants is when we talk about streamlining the, uh, the onboarding process, uh, making sure that that third party could get into your system and engaged quickly, uh, share with us, you know, how you turn that boilerplate process, you know, into something more meaningful for the business. How do you, how are you streamlining your onboarding process for third parties today? I'll go ahead and start at the end of the table with you. Okay, so uh, let me start this in a little bit different direction, uh, which is the risk assessment part of it. So. Anybody that works for a corporation, you're gonna have upstream and downstream third parties. When you do your risk assessment, don't just start with you know reading the latest FCPA news alerts because a lot of those are gonna focus on things that may not really be a risk for you. What we did when we started looking at our third party risk, um, we looked at both. We looked at the upstream, and by that I mean suppliers, vendors. We've got thousands and thousands of them. We're a global manufacturing company just in SAP alone, we have over 170,000 current vendors. That doesn't include those who we've dealt with in the past but may not currently be purchasing from but may in the future. And that's also only what we have in, our, in, in SAP. We've got tens of thousands of others in places. Um, you know, we have large operations in India, for example. Most of our suppliers there are not going to be in SAP. Um, on the downstream side, we sell products all over the world through multiple channels. So when we wanted to look at the risk there, we had to identify the risky areas, the channels. Where we ended up coming back was our greatest risk was on the supply side, our vendors. By sheer volume, um, also we concluded that our, our downstream, the sales channels that we have, for the most part, these are long established relationships with resellers, distributors, or end use customers. Uh, we have what we think are already fairly healthy, robust, kind of sustainable relationships with these, with these parties. Um, not that we don't ignore that, not that we don't build in uh, certain kind of controls at multiple levels in the process of, of uh, you know, identifying new uh, new sales channels, new sales partners, not that we don't build in controls in um, payments. Um, you know, we certainly have all the protections that you're expected to have in terms of the contracts that we have written with these. The real difficulty and where we found the greatest challenge in getting buy-in with the company was on the supply side. First thing we did is we kind of put our ego aside as a compliance group and said this is not something the compliance group is going to solve by itself. We don't have the resources, we don't have the expertise, we don't have that um, intersection with the supply community that that really is is you know really what you need. We don't understand how supply chain works. We don't understand how you select a vendor, how you vet them through the process. We don't even understand how you're going to go in and audit them for for compliance. So several years ago, we started the process of slowly building buy-in with our supply chain people. And we have, the, we have a benefit of having a very, what I think is a very progressive supply chain group. They want to build strategic, long-term, sustainable relationships with vendors, um, which includes a lot of different things. We have some very uh, smart people when it comes to logistics. So one of the value adds that we add to our suppliers is, you sell us a good price, we're going to do a lot of knowledge sharing with you that's going to benefit you not only in servicing our needs, but other customers, customers you, may, you may have as well. So we started very slowly. A lot of it was just with our senior supply chain people. A lot, you know, we spent a lot of time 
making them aware of the <coughs> threats from third parties across the board, not just FCPA, but you know, California Transparency Act, UK Bribery Act, um, uh, Conflict Minerals, uh, also just the reputational risk uh, of you know being associated with somebody that you know find out might be using child labor in in Southeast Asia to um, uh, to harvest timber that we use is part one of our major inputs. Um, the next step was slowly rolling this out to our supply chain community. We started with a supplier code of conduct, and from that we built in identifying uh, certain riskier categories of customers that might be by the material uh, input by that I mean material as in the importance of the input to our to our process maybe it, it may be the, you know based on volume or size it may be based on how difficult it would be to replace it should a difficulty arise in that supply chain and it might also relate to the specific geographic region where they operate we did a lot of hand-holding, which meant a lot of face-to-face -face training with, uh, with that supplier community. Um, not to pick on India, but just as an example, because I think we've done it really well there, uh, bring in hundreds of suppliers multiple times. We sit down, we walk through the supplier code of conduct, we make it very clear to them what our expectations are, but we also dangle a little carrot in front of them, which is, you work with us on this, we're gonna work with you on other things, we're going to make you one of our preferred suppliers. Um, we're going to share a lot of our expertise on supply chain management, on logistics, on a lot of uh, a lot of other areas. And James, uh, when you think about your program, again focused on you know really streamlining. Uh, as you reflect over establishing your program. What do you think is the one, what's the nugget that you can share? What do you think you guys did really well to streamline your program? What were, whether it was uh, an exercise uh, or it was uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, technology, what is it that looking back on it you think you did really well? Sure, I think that, and I wanted to just emphasize Steve's point, was really in-person training. We all have these online training programs that people can do, but the problem is that if you have a centralized procurement team, all the vendors out there are going to have a supplier code of conduct. They're going to check no on all the, rep, all the questionnaires that you send. They know that. They know the drill. They'll get on the internet or they'll work with their team. So the problem is then, how does your procurement team really know what to look for? And if they've gone through just an online training as opposed to an in-person training that's tailored for their specific function or their specific region or their specific area, whether it's an export control question, then they're going to be much more in tune as to, okay, how do I, after I collect all this information, how do I really have the red flags or the radar or the sense of the force, if you will, to sense, okay, what's really going on out there? And if you've given them that in-person training and, and talk to them in the region, whether it's with yourself visiting that region, that makes a huge difference because everyone's going to collect, we all have the detailed questionnaires for bribery and whatever, everyone's going to say all the right things. But if you really want this process to go well, you want your procurement people to say, you know what, this questionnaire looks fine, but there was something about this group. I, I've known about the reputation in the marketplace or the way the payment structures were set up was a little bit unorthodox. Everything looks good, but I have a sense I'm going to raise my hand. Uh, I think the other thing that was important to get people to raise their hand is to treat, teach people that the outcomes are not binary. And that doesn't mean that I'm not trying to say that errors are acceptable, but the problem is that if you teach people that there's only one choice, either it's full compliance or we don't do business with them, they're going to be less likely to raise their hand because someone's going to say, you know what, if I raise my hand here, that's going to slow down the process. I don't want to get in the way of the business. Corporate's going to ask all these questions. We've set the tone for our folks that if there's a red flag, in the questionnaire or in the due diligence process, raise your hand and then we can talk about it. It may be a false red flag or it may be a situation where a vendor has had an issue in the past, but they've corrected it. Maybe they've exited the management team that was involved in sort of bribery or violations or what have you. But I think setting it up that way so that people have a sense of kind of what to look for and are encouraged to kind of raise their hands as opposed to just kind of these yes, no outcomes, you're going to get the feedback that you need. And if you combine that with the in-person training, then you'll be able to quickly zero in on, okay, here's the problems. 
I've got the questionnaire, I've got the code of conduct, but this is the real issue and this is when, hey, I saw something funny with the payments or this person just doesn't feel right. I mean, you don't want to sort of make a judgment on that basis, but if you've given them the tools to ask the questions, because compliance can't do it itself. We're not there, we're not going through and interviewing all the suppliers, we're not asking the questions, and we don't know the business well enough. So if, if everyone's pricing is the same and everyone's sort of proposal is the same, but then there's an extra servicing fee or an extra processing fee, if you've trained them, then they'll be able to see, you know what, okay, that's weird. No one ever asked for that kind of processing fee before. Let me dig into that. Or the payments had to go through in a way that was a little bit unorthodox. I think if you set them up with their in-person training and to not just look for binary outcomes because you have a value, values-based compliance program, you're more likely to get the feedback so you can then zero in on the problem and, and get through the process more quickly. Christine, uh, how do you, in, in, uh, in TE Connectivity, uh, how do you streamline your process so you you, in, you you touch the third party as few times as possible? I know that that's, uh, that's an issue, is creating kind of an overly complex process and burdening the third party in this. So how, how have you, what was your thought process in terms of uh, how often you want to go out and touch that third party, uh, whether it's in the onboarding process or in the, in the ongoing management of that, of that relationship? Sure. Um, I, I think maybe, you know, at a, at a higher level, it's about um, change management and getting the organization on board and demonstrating value across the organization for the, the third-party management process. So it's not only part of compliance, but it, it, it's part of giving the business good business intelligence. But um, we do want to be as least disruptive as possible in reaching out to those third parties. So we do have a uh, questionnaire where we try to get and take as much information as possible on the front end. Um, depending on the risk assessment that's applied to the questionnaire and the information that we receive from our business, we may go back out then and, and follow up with um, references, banking references, or you know, other information to supplement. So it's all done on a, on a risk basis, and um, it's being able to follow up on the things that you know, maybe aren't aligning the outliers and, and following up on some of those red flags. I think it's really uh, important to consider uh, the intake process. So uh, often we hear about uh, you know, a due diligence questionnaire. I would suggest to, uh, to everybody to look at it more as a business intake questionnaire. Uh, and use that opportunity when you're touching that third party to ask other really meaningful questions. So uh, there, there's, uh, there's one business that I'm aware of that asks questions about their storage and refrigeration uh, capabilities because it's relevant to the business. It has nothing to do with compliance, but they're reaching out, they're touching that third party. Uh, it's always a great opportunity. So just think broader in terms of uh, the questions uh, and make that contact really uh, meaningful. Uh, Ken, if I, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, if I could just add to that. I mean, I think you've mentioned before, and I don't want to, you know, get too far ahead about compliance being, you know, the single source of truth. And as we launch, you know, our system, we look for opportunities to collaborate with other departments, other functions, so that we can ask information which is helpful and meaning to the business. And, you know, maybe the reason why we set up the system is, you know, third-party management and, and, you know, perhaps motivated by, uh, corruption risks, but it also can provide good financial information, information perhaps on managing complex minerals or money laundering or supplier setup. And you can broadly cast the net and include more people in the organization so you get more buy-in and more information which is meaningful and shared. Yeah, I mean, typically uh, legal and compliance don't see themselves as the keepers <coughs> of uh, intelligence and information. And the reality of it is, is one of the trends that we're seeing in compliance is that uh, the legal and compliance groups uh, are moving towards becoming that single source of truth. So typically it's been kind of dispersed out in ERPs. Now you're all asking really important questions for the business. And not only are you asking it initially, but you're maintaining that information. So that single source of truth is, is uh, I certainly see that as a, a destination for compliance. Uh, James. Got a question in the back? Oh, sure. Yes. So, um, really sort of a comment that goes along with this, talking about uh, if you start out over there, you're looking at upstream and downstream and supplier risks. Uh, you know, 
weapons tend to look like they're more serious of a threat than the other side. But the point I want to make is, uh, and, and you said it, they don't get the other side. So uh, we're actually in the semiconductor industry, and uh, for those who have been following the headlines, uh, there is uh, practically a war going on right now in China um, over high tech. So we have uh, lots of customers that we sell to in China. And, um, and we look at them and, and you know, we do things to make sure that you know, these are good and solid customers and so forth. But literally, the day before getting on the plane to come to this conference, I get this alert that the U.S. Commerce Department is about to put one of our Chinese customers on the no-fly list. Uh, and so, and, and being the chief compliance and ethics officer in the general counsel, my, my email is just, you know, it's already bad enough. But, and all these people are like, well, what am I supposed to do? I got all these shipments. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into the details of it, but the point I really want to make is, you know, this geographic component, looking at countries, uh, geographies that are the most important. If you're doing business in China nowadays, you had better have a specific Chinese, China strategy to look at it. We, we, we've learned that. Of <coughs> Thank you for sharing that. If, if I could just add yeah. to that, I, I think that's an excellent point. And I think, and going back to the point of streamlining, I think it makes sense to, as you do your questionnaires and your whole intake process, it's a lot of it's a lot more work up front, but it really needs to be tailored for the specific region, for the specific types of services. If you have a one size fits all questionnaire, that's going to slow the process down because people aren't going to understand all the questions, but it's also not going to pick up all of the risks. So you know look at each ge geography, but also the type of services. I mean, we all know that travel agents, that's one of the big sort of areas in China where there's a lot of abuse, but that may not be an issue, obviously, in Belgium. So you want to really have a country by country, and if possible, a specific program, you know, by, by types of procurement, whether it's upstream or downstream. It's more work up front, but that will streamline the process, because as you train your people and implement that process, then they'll say, okay, you know what, for these issues, these are the red flags, and we know what to look for. And you'll be much better, you know, the, the process will be much better much more responsive and much more streamlined. I think one of the challenges that companies typically face is they define this program uh, and you know we've kind of joked about the department of no. Right. Uh, but how do you create uh, a, a program and sell it to the business? Because in as we said most organizations don't have the resources sure. to manage it uh, or for, certainly not to execute on it centrally and so as you push this out throughout the business, you're expecting them to participate vigorously. How do you engage them? Sure, so just to, I'll tell you a little bit about liquidity services. What's different about liquidity services, although I think there are some lessons learned, is that compliance is what we're selling. So we're taking large amounts of surplus equipment, sensitive material that can only be sold to certain parties. It's highly regulated by either export controls or ITAR or any other, the, so that whole sort of regime. One of our biggest clients is also the Department of Defense. So even though they want the best the best price they can get, they're much more focused on this can't be sold, you know, what we call headline risk. We don't want to be in the headlines because of doing business with you. So I think the lesson learned from that, though, is that we took the position when we created our compliance function as part of our business growth is that the main st stakeholder was the business. If you go to your board and your CEO, oh, of course, compliance is important. Um, if you go to, you know, sort of the you know, risk management or, or finance, of course, compliance is important. But we went to the sales team and said, hey, look, this is going to be a key part of what you're doing. This is the investment we're going to make. And we're, we're very disciplined in our company because 
all of the costs of the, the legal and compliance function are charged down to the P&L. So that gets everyone's attention, right? Why am I paying for this? So rather than start with, hey, we're the department of no, we started with, this is gonna enable your sales process. Now, that may not be true for each of you, but I think the lesson learned is that we went to them and said, this is how this is gonna help you, sales, procurement, uh, any of your sort of third party constituencies. And once they were bought in, and once we showed them how we could streamline the process, how we could better protect them, how we could better able to close the process, and then track with KPIs how responsive we were and how quickly we were able to get through a due diligence process or the overall contracting process, that changed the whole conversation. Because everyone looks at this and goes, oh great, I've got to close this deal, I've got these crazy questionnaires, please don't slow my deal down. As opposed to, boy, we're already prepped for India, we've got our specific set of questions and and information we have to collect, it's built into our contract. The sales team and procurement team are trained to ask the right questions. Great, this is not gonna slow my sales cycle down, we're on board. And of course, you know, everyone understands the risk aspect and avoiding the embarrassment in the headlines, but I think that really is your most important constituent, is gonna be your business customer. Because now it's easy, so then we go through the budget process and the head of the P&L says, okay, let's talk about compliance. His sales team or her sales team has already said, we need them, they're doing a great job for us, so it's a much easier conversation. So I would start, regardless of how compliance fits into your business, start with the actual customer, procurement, sales, operations. Once they're bought in, work with them proactively, track your pro progress through KPIs, I know Christine, you do this as well, and, and report back to them regularly. Hey, look, here's the issues that we've spotted, here are the areas where we've been able to avoid risk, here's the <coughs> problem we solved for you, particularly if it's a situation where there is a, either a false red flag or if, if there's a risk from a risk management standpoint, it makes sense to, with certain you know, corrective measures to move forward, report back to them on a regular basis and make sure you understand their business and understand what they're doing. If you're asking questions in a vacuum but you don't know what the procurement person is facing in China or what the third person responsible for third party is facing in Belgium, you're not gonna be able to add value. Um, I think those are sort of really the key the key things that I, I'd say are important. Sure, sure. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you the same question, Christine. KPIs. I think this is so important uh, to be able to go back to the business and say, listen, this is these are the KPIs we're tracking, and this is how it's benefiting the business. This is in a compliance process. It's really helping the business. What are some of the KPIs that Liquidity Services tracks? And then same question for you, Christine. Sure, I think the biggest is really the turnaround time because we track, you know, across the department, I'm in the general counsel, so I look at not just compliance but also the overall sales process. We've got software that tracks how long does it take to turn around the contract, how long does it take to get, and we use contract, you know, contract management software app to sort of facilitate that process. And we also track, okay, once compliance got involved, what was its impact on the sales cycle and the, and the process to close? Did it, did it have an impact? And the good news, because we, we had all this buy-in, there wasn't an impact. The sales cycle was the same as it was before. The process didn't take any longer. And that ultimately is what's gonna get their attention, whether it's a procurement person or a salesperson. If you're able to sort of do your process and engage with them in a way that show, you know, and demonstrate that over time you're turning around contracts at the same level, you're turning around your questions at the same time, and their sales cycle isn't slowing down, that's the one that's gonna grab everyone's headlines. I think that's the one. And of course, and then you're able to point out too, this is maybe less of a KPI, but we do spot red flags and we do spot issues. So part of it is, hey, look, we're moving as quickly as we can. We're not moving any, you're not going any more slowly than before we had compliance. And guess what? These are the five situations we avoided. This was an agent that had we not gone through this process, we would have had an issue with FCPA. Or this is a buyer, if we hadn't screened them, if we hadn't gone through and collected the right due diligence, we would have had a problem with export controls. But I would say the turnaround time and the responsiveness, that's the one that's gonna get everyone's attention. So, um, you know, we measure lots of things in the program, and I, I think, um, you know, to me, the, the, the KPIs and the information that we share with the business is really critical to showing the business the value of the program and getting their buy-in and, and the continuous improvement. Um, so like you, James, you know, we measure the contract time, the, the entire cycle time for approval of a business partner, the number of denied parties, the number of different types of parties. When we teamed up with procurement to do our supplier review, I think um, we got a, some pushback initially because they had their own setup process. But as we started looking through the ERP systems, do you, are you aware, like, you have, you know, you know, whatever, X amount of suppliers 
And you know, we started reviewing them, shutting off inactive suppliers, and now all of a sudden we got procurement's buy-in because it was wow, there's a there's a cost savings to, you know, uh, deactivating some of these suppliers, to rationalizing and, and saying, you know, instead of using five people for this service, we're going to use one. And um, so, I mean, those are some of the other KPIs we've tracked. I mean, we share with the business on a regular basis, you know, we have shut off or blocked, you know, X amount of third parties. That is the benefit of reducing our risk, but it's also less organizational, you know, burden. And um, I think as compliance people, we should challenge ourselves to think beyond the element of compliance and be able to use the, the metrics and the story about, you know, how we can add value to the business. Yeah, let, let me make one yeah. comment on that. You kind of touched on something that was something of a, I, I guess kind of was an epiphany for a lot of us when we were looking at our supply chain. And this, this would also apply to the downstream side, the selling side. And that is, you know, we realize there are a lot of other processes out there in the company that are, are put into effect when you're either trying to find a new customer or a new supplier. Compliance is not the only one. Um, you've got a whole credit department that's going to be looking at a lot of the same things you're going to want to <laughs> with regard to any kind of compliance, due diligence, or, or vetting of, you know, again, either the upstream or the downstream parties. Steve, what are you doing in your, in your business to, uh, to handle volumes? I mean, uh, c when companies think about their third parties, uh, I hear some companies describe third party population as in the hundreds, which is very small and then you have other extremes where organizations are managing literally hundreds of thousands of, of third parties and your organization sounds like you have a large population how are you managing those volumes how did you is there a technology or a process that you've put in place is it centralized uh it, how often do you change that that process so it is centralized um the the technology we're relying on um that's a tough question to answer because we're, we're not using anything unique to this process. We have different tools. Uh, you know, anybody who does background checks for export, you know, you all know you go check the OFAC list. You look for specially designated nationals. Well, fine. I can I include that as a technology solution, but it's not. You know, it's not a. It's not this cleanly designed soup to nuts kind of kind of process. What we do is, again, we're relying on the people who are the front line of, uh, you know, with these third parties. Who is going to have to collect the information? Who's going to have to get the documents to certify that these are legitimate companies? Check their credit, uh, banking statements, articles of incorporation. Um, make sure their tax ID numbers are legitimate and not fraudulent. You know, all of these things. And we're building our own database of all this. Um, the database will kick out those third parties that meet certain criteria, the red flag kind of criteria. Those then will get funneled off or channeled off to different groups. You know, our credit group may, you know, get a get a list of companies that come back problematic from their perspective. Our manufacturing group may get one that comes back problematic for reasons pre-identified by manufacturing and kind of built into the system. And then for the compliance side, you know, the first big red flag is, is this third party going to be either selling to or interacting with a government agency or government employees in some form or fashion? And to the comment in the back, that's kind of where we build in the regionalization here. I'm a big believer that, that the level, the average person is no more corrupt anywhere in the world than they are anywhere else. The issue is you have different flavors of corruption by country or by region, and those flavors are the result of many different things. Um, so what we try to do is we try to identify flags for specific reasons. In, in India, we'll look at, we'll identify certain types of things as risky um, uh, flags. China is going to be different. Russia is going to be different. Latin America will be different. But if it's a compliance-related red flag that gets raised, it gets routed to my group. You know, that's where the clock starts ticking on my group. That's where we start doing what we have to do to make sure we can get an answer back either you know yes it's fine let's go with this third party or no we need to do more work or you know in, in a very few rare cases it's no we we can't work with you at all 
And Christine, at uh, a TE, who's involved uh, in your process? Uh, uh, maybe not even at, at a department level, you know, let's just maybe procurement compliance type, but who are the individuals? Who do you think are key stakeholders within, and try and keep it generic, you know, in terms of uh, maybe uh, what companies can look for or who they could target in terms of uh, alliances within the organization? Um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, great question. I mean, I, I think the statement was made before. I mean, this has to be for the benefit of the business, right? So uh, beginning with the end in mind. But um, I, I think we look broadly to collaborate with all of the functions within the organization. And I, I think, you know, that's no different in third-party management than anything else in <coughs> compliance is to be able to perform, you know, to get alliances. Um, we, um, you know, certainly work very closely with um, our, our business units who are either engaging the third parties for, for sales operations or for uh, supply. Um, but I think there's also uh, collaborating and teaming up with finance. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think a really important player is also our IT organization. Um, working with them in you know this process, we were able to implement you know internal controls around the program to be able to you know within our financial systems provide information that you know this third party is under assessment and is pending. This third party has been denied and able to put financial controls and, and blocks in place, um, which is important to make sure that we have um, you know effectiveness in the program. But also to um, um, uh, for for reporting information as well. And I'm curious, the business when you uh, when you you know, and this seems to be a theme is how important the business is uh, in executing the program. To what extent is the business actually involved in um, uh, in the decision process of engaging a third party? Uh, <coughs> Do they understand yeah. the uh, maybe the evaluation or adjudication process around red flags, and what is their their actual participation? Sure, and and even taking it up a, a level, I mean, I, I think we, this is a little bit about change management too. I mean, when we launched the program, making sure everybody knew why we had the program, what people's roles and responsibilities were. Um, we uh, launched um, not only training programs, but videos you know, for our third parties, as well as for our employees as to roles and responsibilities. <laughs> but for every third party within um, our organization, there needs to be a business sponsor. So an employee who says, you know, this is the third party, this is why we need the third party, this is how we're gonna do business with the third party, and I will be accountable for that third party. So every third party has an owner, which I, I think is critically important. And then that business sponsor is responsible for shepherding that third party through the process. So we may get an, um, a business partner questionnaire out to the third party, but if it's not returned, we're in communication with the business sponsor or our, our employee to say, hey, you know, this information is outstanding. You know, want you to know that, you know, we need this information or even through, you know, certifications. So we're working constantly, um, you know, with the, with the business in order to move the process along. And as we get in kind of the more risk and the, the evaluation of the partner, um, there may be, you know, our team may, um, you know, identify issues, um, you know, areas of concern, you know, potential red flags. And then there's a conversation with the business to understand, you know, what's the business model? You know, how long have we done business? You know, what kind of services, you know, are, are, are basically to understand the track record of the third party. So it has to be a very collaborative process. And, you know, um, I think the biggest risk and concern that I have is if you have a mature process, you know, that it could become mechanical and then you're not going to get what you need out of the process. Every situation, I mean, you don't know. I mean, it, there could be a, a question mark. And if you're not looking carefully at every situation, you know, it, it, it could turn out to be something that is uh, a flag that, you know, frankly, you miss. Would you, uh, it'd be interesting, would you define or how would you explain are there peripheral consequences? You know, we hear the, the business sponsor and they have ownership. Are there peripheral consequences to them or the business unit? I, I, I'm thinking about KPIs. If the process isn't going well, mm -hmm. 
Can you narrow it down to a business unit or that business sponsor? Yes, we've um, been able through our you know reporting and you know Brian's taken the lead on this. So we we meet. Um, you know, at least on a quarterly basis with our uh, all of our businesses, and we're able to say, you know, you have this many third parties pending, you know, this many need diligence, this many, you know, we're waiting for questionnaires, this is your certification rate, this is your denial rate, and, you know, we're also able to introduce a competitive element, too, to say, you know, this is how this business is doing compared to this business. Um, you know, not that... It's a competition. And people get but, that visibility. I mean, yes, and I, I think it's really important to you know to to to, to you know driving the program and and showing um, you know the volume that goes through and and you know being able to tell the story as well. I, I want to change gears a little bit, and uh, with, with the remaining time that we have, uh, is talk a little bit about. Uh, compliance's role in your go-to-market strategy are you, is compliance uh, on the front line of that go-to-market strategy, and I and again looking at it from the business perspective, uh, and then uh, maybe broader to that is uh, if you are on the front line, are you educating the business on broader risks? Uh, I, again, we've talked about. Uh, you know, uh, maybe ABAC or, or export control. Are there broader risks that that you're you're considering in that go-to-market strategy as well? I'll pose that to you first, please, James. Okay, sure. So, <clears throat> at Liquidity Services, compliance really is part of the go-to strategy because when we go to a multinational a pharmaceutical company, or if there's a plant closing and there's equipment that can again it can only, it's subject to export controls. It can only be sold in certain jurisdictions, or it has to be disposed of in the right way. We have a lot of oil and gas clients. Again, there's a lot of <clears throat> excuse me regulatory restrictions that will govern how their products are sold. So our compliance officer really is there hand-in-hand mm -hmm. hand with the business development team closing the transaction. In fact, some of you actually may be clients. A lot of times, the deal won't even go forward until a compliance officer or an export control expert has spoken to our compliance officer to talk about our process for disposing of assets. So that makes it a little easier at our company because it is part of the it is part of sort of the go to market strategy and compliance even more than sort of the financial benefit we offer to to, to clients. Again, keep them out of the headlines is so and so important. So it is it is part of it, but. I think what you can draw from that, even if it isn't as deeply interwoven at your company as it is ours, is that you know that reputational risk, particularly for trying to build sustainable partnerships, really is it is important. And even if it's not as deeply woven as it is our company, you know everyone's taking a look at this. Everyone's looking at their vendors. Everyone's looking at their third party to try to assess: okay, are they doing the right thing? Are they creating value for us? And it's a little bit smoother for us because of our business strategy. But I still think. Reputation is always going to be part of either what you're evaluating or what you're selling, particularly if you're dealing with the folks who are, you know, who represent the companies in this room, because no one wants to be associated with someone that's paid a bribe or in the headline risk, and it sort of creates all of these issues. Um, it helps in our in our company because our compliance team is right there. That also helps, though, in terms of understanding the business and understanding what their goals are and helping train them what to look for. So, because our compliance officer is working so closely with the sales team. You know, she's able to say, okay, wow, this is this is an issue. I understand what's going on. But it is part of the frontline strategy. But I think even if it isn't, it has to be because if you think about you know, your path to building your reputation, your path to sort of how people are compensated, your path to sort of measuring performance, if this is all set up in the, within the right framework, you'll be, you'll be seen as a partner, not as an obstacle. How, Christine, how do you uh, or how does TE uh, monetize reputational risk? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that question. I mean, I I think, um, you know, it's um, I mean, it's it, it only takes a, a an instant in order to to ruin your reputation. So um, I think, you know, going back to the sustainable practices. I mean, and I want to give Stephen credit for that when we were chatting over breakfast. Um, it has to be embedded in everything that you do in the foundation. And, um, you know, you could certainly get short-term wins, you know, uh, with uh, processes. But uh, I think, um, you know, and a theme even at this conference is making sure that you embed, you know, compliance in the business um, because that's really the only sustainable long-term um, way to be successful. 
Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, you know, in the old days, your business people, whether you were looking at, you know, your go-to-market strategy was focusing on acquisitions, moving into new regions, selling into new markets, selling into new segments, finding new parties to sell to or buy from. The business people's view was, look, if there's a if there's a, a mess to clean up, we'll clean it up after the fact. That doesn't work anymore because now those messes are big and those messes are going to be all over <coughs> social media. It's going to be all over the newspaper. I mean, you know, look at what Costco, trouble Costco got into for buying shrimp that happened to be raised on farms, fed feed that was caught by Thai fishermen that are, were, were enslaved. You know, two or three levels removed, but, you know, now Costco is in the, in the headlines, in the newspapers. Um, so the old view of we'll let Leo clean up the mess after we find out what it is, that just doesn't work anymore. And if that's still the attitude you have, you need to sit down with your GC or whoever the, the key decision makers are in this area and tell them, you know, you, you got to find a solution to that. You got you to change that mindset. Well, thank you so much. We hope that we've been able to give you a few nuggets. So enjoy the rest of the conference.